All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending. I'm Rebecca Graves from the Health Sciences Library, though I'm obviously at home during our pandemic times. And I'm co-presenting co with... And I'm Janice Dysert. I'm also at home. And I'm a science librarian based in Ellis Library. And today we are going to be talking about maximizing your research identity and impact. And there should, there is a hand on it. And yes, the link is in the chat. So if you didn't pull it up in your email, it's a convenience that you have the different websites handy to refer to as we go through our talk, because there's several places that we're going to talk about. And this way you don't have to scramble to get the URLs in there on your page. And if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, and we will keep an eye on those. Um, you can also unmute and ask a question too if you want to do it that way. Um, so the problem that we're addressing today, or at least one of them, is a confusion over names and name ambiguity. And I'm, and I'm assuming many of you have run into this, maybe not all, but where people have confused your name or you've had trouble tracking down a colleague or a researcher you're interested in. And some of the reasons can be people with it. Like I actually one time worked with a researcher here on campus and he, his name was a common name and there was another gentleman, same name, different institution, but same field. And so their papers got mixed up all the time. People change names for marriage, gender change, um, cultural conventions, does the family name or does the person's name, per individual name come first? Um, people move institutions, they also may shift the field that they're working in. So a lot of reasons why it's hard to track people just by name. So you may have heard of the ORC ID number. And so I'm going to ask for those of you who are on, if you'd look under participants and you would say yes or no on whether or not you have heard, or actually yes or no if you have an ORC ID number. I guess we'll just jump ahead to that question. Does anybody have, so we have one yes, one no. Okay, so wow, we have four yeses on the ORC ID numbers and one no. Um, so this might this will be review to those four of you who have the numbers so the orc id number and i'm going to share my screen now um and i'm actually going to cancel that one so the orc id number is orchid it is your a personal id number or a personal or global badge if you like and it was created um I'm going to lose that box on my screen. It was created about eight years ago. And this helps to disambiguate people's names. And it's free to sign up for this. So for the person who hasn't signed it up or any of you who haven't didn't vote, please feel free while I'm talking that you can actually go in and you can register. And why is this important? Well, for the reasons that I mentioned, plus publishers, so I'm going to show Springer Nature, is requesting or requiring that you actually have an ORC ID number or ORC ID number to post with your work. So they actually will say here, here's how you can sign up and here's how you can do it. And so to get what it shows, so I'm gonna go in here up at the top and I'm gonna search on um, Sergey Kopikin. And I misspelled his name or mistyped it. So that is important. So when I search on here, I find the gentleman that I'm looking for and I can select his record. So you can do this for yourself. You can do this for colleagues, for researchers that you're interested in following or working with. And it'll give quite a bit of information. So you can see the employment, the education, and you can see um, invited positions. And if I scroll down, you can see peer review where they work there. Um, and you can also see papers. 
So you can see that this is a pretty robust profile. And if you go in and look at yours, or if you create one for yourself, you'll see that you can actually determine section by section what is public and what is shared. So you can actually make it private to where only you have the information and the folks at ORCID ID, ORCID of course, um, or you can make it publicly available. So you, they do give you that control. Um, they have set it up, let me scroll up to the top so you see where I am. So they do have information, they do have it connected. So working with publishers and working through, um, oh, I'm, <laughs> um, Ah, I'm blanking on the organization. I hate it when I blank on names. Um, working with um, Crossref and Datasite, that your work will be automatically sent back to ORCID ID and added to your profile here. Now you do have to approve that. So when you're setting up your profile, you can set up trusted organizations. And also once you have an ORC ID number, say if you publish with Springer and they, your article comes up, they would actually send you an email back saying, hey, we want to share this with Crossref. Um, do you allow this? And you can say yes, and then it'll automatically be sent back. So you do have control on it. Um, but that is one piece that we highly recommend that you set up if you have not already and that you recommend that your colleagues set up. It's also good if you have graduate students that you are mentoring or you have a lab that of folks working with you that that allows you to track their professional career, which is an impact upon your mentorship or, or a a representation of your mentorship. So that's another piece that you can use the ORCID ID number for, is to show this is who I've collaborated with and this is what they've gone on to achieve. And I think that's all I wanna, I mean, we could spend more time on ORC ID, but it's basically the idea that you come to ORC ID, we highly recommend that you sign up for one and then you will have your own personal number, and you can control how your profile shows. Um, we're going to be talking about some other IDs, so I'm going to turn it over to Janice for Scopus. Okay. And I'm, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to start sharing. Actually, I lost my... There we go. I covered up my share bar. Oh. Okay, let's see. Okay, Rebecca talked about um, a profile that you have to initiate yourself before you get one. And I'm going to talk about one that's automatically set up for you once you've published several articles, and that is the Scopus profile. Scopus, if you're not familiar with Scopus, it is a, a very large database that indexes about 23,000 journals in all different subject areas, though I have to say it's strongest in the sciences and the social sciences. And so we're going to look at Scopus just by going down to our database listing. I'm looking at Scopus. Scopus, um, the producer of Scopus is Elsevier, which probably I'm sure some of you recognize as a very large publisher, primarily of scientific journals, though I think they do have some non-scientific journals too. But Scopus covers far more journals than just Elsevier titles. And we're going to look up the same person, Copacan, and you can tell I looked him up earlier. And you can see he is published under multiple names here. And, and so far, Scopus has tracked 86 of his articles and he's currently affiliated with the University of Missouri. If I click on his name, I can see the profile that Scopus has created for him. 
and you can see they, um, if the person has an ORC ID, they do list it here. And actually, if, um, if you set up an ORC ID and you have um, publications and Scopus, you can use this link over here on the right, connect to ORC, and you can basically upload the articles that you have listed in Scopus directly into ORC, so you don't have to ORCID ID, so you don't have to input the information yourself. And just continuing down, again, you see all the, his different names and different subject areas, how many articles he's written, how many times he's been cited. There's a nice little graphic here that shows he's, you know, published articles since about 1994, up to date, and the blue bars are the articles he's written, and then you can see how often they've been cited. It looks like 2019 has been his, his best year so far. And if you continue down, you get into the articles that he's written. And as I mentioned, Scopus automatically sets this up for you. And they do the best job they can with trying to determine which articles belong to which person. And certainly if you have an ORC ID, that helps Scopus out a lot. But um, if, they, if you don't have a Scopus, or an ORC ID, then sometimes Scopus, and even if you do, sometimes Scopus may make a mistake where they assign an article to you that is not one of yours, or possibly they miss one of your articles. And if you see, and so really what you should do, once you start publishing articles, have at least two articles that are in Scopus, you should check Scopus once a year and just look at your profile and make sure that the articles are correctly attributed to you. And if you see a mistake, like they've given you an article that you did not write, you can come up here to the right side of the page and there's a link called Edit Author Profile. And you can click on this link and it will take you step by, it takes you step by step through a process that lets you indicate this article is not one you've written, you want it taken out of your account and then that will be done. If you see articles that Scopus has missed listing, um, first you have to check and make sure it's a, they were published in a, in a journal that Scopus covers. And if it is, then you can contact Scopus directly just from their help um, email and report that you would like this article added to your account um, normally they'll kind of, they'll get back to you and then say, please send us a copy of the article and then they'll go from there. But I've done that for faculty and their Scopus is very good about making corrections. And they're also, they've also gotten very quick about making corrections. It used to be a few years ago, it took them weeks and weeks. They, they would acknowledge the correction, but they'd say, well, it'll take about you know, six weeks for it to appear in the database. And now it's more like a couple of weeks. So they've gotten quite fast about it. Now Scopus is a, a resource that libraries have to subscribe to. So if you end up working somewhere or that does not have a subscription to Scopus, you can still check your Scopus profile. They've set it up so if you just Google Scopus author profile, there'll be a link that you can click on to check your profile that does not require you to be a subscriber to look at it. So again, really you just need to do that like once a year, once you start having articles in Scopus and, and that's all you need to do as far as maintenance for Scopus. Now, one thing I thought we'd talk about today is this H-index. Um, you're starting to see H-index mentioned in a lot more places. Um, this is saying Dr. Kopakin has an H-index of 22. And what the H-index is, it was created, um, I think about, maybe about 12 years ago or so, not all that long ago, by, um, a physics professor in Spain, and his name is Jorge Hirsch. And he wanted to come up with a metric 
that define both or indicated both an author's impact and productivity. And so he came up with the H index. He could have called it the Hirsch index, but he went with H index. And what this 22 is telling you is that Dr. Kopakin has written 22 articles that have been cited at least 22 or more times. Now you can see he's written far more than 22 articles, but so far only 22 of them have been written 22 or more times. And then you, you go, well, is this good? Is 22 an H index of 22, is that, is that good? And basically it's all relative. It's relative that the, to the field that you're in and it's also, and you also have to compare yourself to other researchers that have been in the field about as long as, as in this case, Dr. Kopakin has been in. Because certainly when you're starting out, you've only been in the field a year or two or three, and you, and you maybe only have a few articles. Well, your H index cannot be higher than the number of articles you've published. So gradually over time, as you write more articles, as you can see from this chart, as he's written more articles and he's gotten cited more times, his H index is going to increase. And if he compared himself to other people in the field, I'm guessing he'd probably discover that 22 is very good for an astronomer. And so it's just kind of a measurement. You can, you can look at, you can create a, um, or figure out your H index yourself. Um, let's, let's go back. I didn't, um, we didn't mention starting out that we've created a guide for this workshop and it's listed on the little handout outline that we sent out. It's right above Rebecca and I's names on the last page. And let's do, well, I think I can just put in researcher. I can spell. Okay, this is the guide. You can see there are a lot of researcher profiles. We're not talking about all these today. You'll be happy to hear that. Um, but more and more are coming out all the time. We're talking about really the most important ones today. Now let's go to H index for a minute. And if we scroll down, I put in an example of, this is just an anonymous researcher and they've just organized their articles by the most cited article first and then you start going down. So these are citation counts on the right and article numbers on the left. And you just start going down and when your article number is higher than time cited, you drop back one and this will be your H index, the article number. So this researcher would have an H index of currently of a six. Now, if this article number seven gets cited two more times, or if this article number eight gets cited six more times, his H index will go up to seven. So over time, if you continue to publish and get cited, your H index will increase over time. Okay, let's go back to um, go back to his profile and let's look at one other thing on this profile. If you go down, we're going to look at let's look at one of his articles here. Um, hmm. Oh, here's the one I was looking for high performance clocks. If you look at the full display for this article, you'll see a very colorful little graphic over here on the right. And what this graphic is representing is a fairly new area called altmetrics. And th through the years, um, historically, the main metric that indicated the impact importance of an article has been how many times it's been cited. And in this case, this article has been cited 18 times. But with the advent of all this um, social networking and 
social platforms. They've come out about, I think it's really about a little over 10 years ago, they came out with something called Altmetrics, which is basically different mentions of social media about research. And there's a company, one of the companies that tracks this information is called Plum X. And it's owned by it's owned by Elsevier now. Originally, it was not owned by Elsevier, but Elsevier bought it, so now they put the information into Scopus. And if you these little spokes, um, they represent different social mentions, and the colors are symbols for each of the different ones. But if you just click on it, it will expand on what they are, and you can see like this article has been downloaded by, by people using Mendeley. Mendeley is a um, citation management software system. It's been referenced in Wikipedia. It's been tweeted a few times. So currently, it's probably Altmetrics is probably of most interest to the author to sort of, it's, it's kind of nice once your article's Publish, you can immediately start looking to see if there's any altmetric data on it to see what's happening. In the past, you had to wait months just to see if an article's been cited. So altmetrics gives you a little bit more current feedback. And let's, um, let's look at a few more examples. There's another company that does altmetrics. And, it actually, and I figure it must be the first company that came out and started tracking these metrics because its name, its company name is Altmetrics, Altmetric. And it um, publishes its data in a free database called Dimensions. Dimensions came out a few years ago. It's a database that's similar to Scopus. It indexes a lot of scholarly academic journals and You're listed here. You can see Altmetric is right here. I thought I'd look up an article that was written by a professor, an MU professor from a few years ago that got a lot of social media attention. Just to give you an example of one that's, oops, that has been talked about a lot. And this lady has done research on insects chewing on plants and the reactions to the plants to that. And this article she published in 2014, you can see the altmetric count here is over a thousand, which is quite high. And if you run your cursor over this number, a little window will pop up and you can see in general what's going on. Like 92 news outlets have talked about this article and it's been blogged and tweeted and mentioned in Facebook and Wikipedia. If you click on this little rectangle with the number, it will take you to a page that gives you more information. And what I always like to look at is the news articles that have come out on research. And you can see in, in this case, I mean, a lot of news articles came out right when the article was published. But even today, you know, just a few months ago, there was an article about this research that was done, you know, reported on six years ago. So that's, that's pretty amazing. So if I was this person, you know, certainly if they're applying for a job or going up for promotion, they would probably want to highlight this article on their and mention that, you know, it's gotten a lot of attention. And it's also kind of a, I guess an example of why you might want to promote your research. I mean, that's sort of a new movement is scientists need to start promoting their research more um, to bring attention to it. it. It's possible it could increase the number of times the article is cited, um, hard to say. Um, they're doing studies on that, but they haven't done anything definitive yet. And to wrap it up, there are publishers that are starting to track this data too. 
So once you start publishing articles, you'll want to check the journal website. Plus One, Plus One is a pretty high profile open access journal that was one of the earliest ones um, to start tracking, doing metrics. And they did, um, a few years ago, there was an article that I noticed that was on talking about insect biomass really decreasing over the past few years by 75%. And that article is published in Plus One. And let's see, here it is. We're just at the journal website and looking at the article page, you'll see there's a tab for metrics. And that's what a lot of journals are doing now. They're adding a tab for metrics. In the case of Elsevier, they're creating an author dashboard where you can go in, once you have an, you've authored an article in the Elsevier journal, you get access to this dashboard and you can track your journal and see what kinds of metrics are happening with it. Uh, they summarize the metrics up here on the upper right hand corner, but if you click on the tab, you can get details. And of course, the main uh, metric journals are published or tracking is how often the article is viewed, how often it's downloaded. Probably downloads count more than views. You can see this article was published or viewed over half a million times, and it's been downloaded. 89, over 89,000 times. So it's gotten a lot of um, attention. And they give you a little, sometimes they give you graphics. So it's, it's something to be aware of and to maybe once you start publishing articles, just, just check and see what's happening. And it maybe it's just of interest to you or it may be something you can, you can highlight to others to indicate, you know, your research is getting attention. Any questions on any of that? Scopus, H index, alt metrics, if not. Um, there is, there is one chat or a question in the chat and it's saying which of these sites metrics are most often utilized for consideration of tenure and why? Um, well, I have to say, I can't say they're most often used. I'd say right now, I can't say they're used a lot in promotion and tenure. It's sort of a growing area. Um, right now, it's still a um, number of times articles have been cited and journal ranking, which I'm going to talk about right at the end. This is sort of a growing field. So I think since you're starting out, I think it's going to become more and more important. Um, you can, some institutions have subscribed to say Plum X or Altmetric. And in that case, you get an author dashboard and you can really easily track stuff. The University of Missouri has not yet done that. Um, it does take money. And of course, right now we don't have the money to do things like that. So it may depend on whether an institution, I mean, who's the head of the institution, what, what their interest is, whether or not they subscribe. My personal preference is I like Altmetric because I think it gives you the most information about an article. And they also track um, policy mentions and usage in patents, which, which could be pretty important. I know in like the business, if you, in the business school, it was, they were very interested in whether their research was being mentioned in policy. Um, so as I said right now in promotion and tenure, I don't think it's a big deal yet. I think it's going to start growing. So basically be aware of it. And then, you know, if you're going up for promotion and they ask for some of this stuff, you'll know what it is and you, you'll know where you can look for it. Okay, so now we're going to go back and look at another profile. So after having looked at metrics, so I'm going to stop Janice's share and I'm going to share my screen. And this time we're going to take a look at Google Scholar. And again,
again, I'm going to ask folks, um, how many of you have a Google Scholar profile? So if you go to participants and underneath say yes or no. Okay, so it sounds like we, we have a similar split to what we did for um, Work ID. So again, for those of you who know of this, this will be um, familiar. Um, for those who are new, here's something new that you can learn. So like the Work ID, the Google Scholar, you have to sign up for. And you can use it to look people up. So again, we're going to search for um, our guy, Sergey Kopikin. And I left the, I, this time I did an even worse spelling, typing of his name. All right, got it. So when you search for a person in Google Scholar, if they have a profile, it should show up. Um, and it'll be at the top of the list and it'll have that quill next to it. And so it gives just basic name, affiliation and cited by. If you click on the link, it takes you to their page and you see that he can have a photo there. You can have the affiliation, can have areas he studies. Um, it's not as rich as your ORC ID profile um, as I scroll down because it's basically your or his um, publications. On the right-hand side, it does show those basic metrics. So these are ones that are used for promotion and tenure. So like how many documents, how many publications does he have? How many times have they been cited? And you see that this also lists the H index. And you can see that the H index is different. As Janice said for Scopus, it was 22. For Google Scholar, it's 37. There's some reasons for this. Um, Google Scholar, we assume, is a bigger database. We don't know exactly because as a private company, it doesn't disclose all the sources of its information. However, we do know it includes PubMed, and they have worked with many publishers to scan and um, index their journals and also with some organizations. Um, Google Scholar will also index and pull up books and book chapters. So if you're in a field that's more book dominant than journal article dominant, Google Scholar might be a good platform for you um, to have a profile in. And that also makes, you know, points out that as Janice says, these numbers are all relative. So they're relative to the field, they're relative to yours or the researcher's years in the profession. So you don't, I mean, if you're just starting out, you wouldn't compare yourself to somebody who's got 20 years advantage. You might look at that and say, that's where I want to go. Um, and also it's dependent on which um, source you're using. So you would have to say H index per um, Google Scholar or H index per Scopus. And that's something to check out is to see which metric your department and your campus prefers. Um, do they want both of them? Like at the, at the department level, they might want both. Um, I think at the campus level, you know, I'm gonna have to double check that, but I believe it's the um, Scopus. And then they have an additional um, metric here, which is the I-10. And so that's the number of publications in the last five years that have 10 or more citations. So you can see how there's a lot of different metrics to use, um, just as there's a lot of different profile sites. So there's some core ones like citation, like citation counts um, and H index. And as Janice mentioned, there's additional ones and the alt metrics are part of that. So it's like, which ones are important? Um, depends on your department and campus. And you'll have to look at the guidelines for that. But also you can think about how if you are going to make an argument for yourself to, um, for promotion, for hire, et cetera, um, is that in an introduction you can say this paper had this much impact in the news and in, you know, Wikipedia or in policies. So you could write that up even if it's not a required statistic that you list in the document section. 
Um, so to create a Google Scholar profile, if I go back to Google Scholar, you can just click on my profile. Open, I'm already logged in, so let me actually sign out. So if you click on my profile, it's going to ask you if you want to create an account. And then you can just say create an account. It knows that I've been here. And so it's going to say, all right, you can log in and I'm going to use my name. And so it brings it up. And you can see again how you can edit your profile. You can add references and Google will crawl. Google Scholar for you and add suggest references for you. So it will add them to you. You do have to double check it because it may add some that aren't yours or it may miss some that are yours. So again, none of these are foolproof. You do have to follow up and you do have to um, double check them. So it's kind of like having a an assistant who it does good work, but every so often they have errors creep in. So you do, do need to check on that. Um, and that, let's see, I'm double checking to see, all right, no chats. So I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it over to Janice for impact factors and journal rankings. Okay, she switched the order on me, but that's fine. Oh, I didn't, sorry share. about that. No, that's fine. I, I usually, it's fine. I'll go ahead and do impact factors real quick since I mentioned them earlier. Let me go back to one of my screen. I did switch it. That's okay. Okay, impact factors are um, a way that people are using to rank journals. Um, I think they, I forgot when they were actually created for the first time, but impact factors, journal impact factors have been around a long time. They are based on data that's used, that collected from the database Web of Science. And Web of Science is another large academic database that covers scholarly research. It's similar to Scopus. It doesn't cover quite as many journals and it doesn't, so it does not um, does not um, give impact or compute impact factors for all the journals that exist. It's a core group of journals, which I think is around 13,000 or so. It's quite a few, but not every journal. And impact factor, it's going to, going to be a numerical value. And basically it's the average time number of times an article is cited that's been published in a particular journal. So if a journal had an impact factor of five, it would mean on the average an article published in that journal is cited five times. Now people, not everybody, are, not everyone is are fans of impact factors because they say, well, journals publish articles and some of them are never cited. And so, and also um, articles can be cited that are indicating, you know, bad research and people are highlighting the fact that it's bad research. So they're, so they're citing the article, but that impact factors, I mean, they keep hanging around. And so in most cases in promotion and tenure, they're still asking you for impact factors of journals. And we do have, a lot of times you can find the um, journal impact factor on a journal page, um, but we do have a resource called Journal Citation Reports where I'm gonna look that up. It's considered a database. And of course, um, If you want to increase your impact, basically people will tell you, well, you need to you need to get published in journals that have high impact factors because that means your article has a better chance of being cited. So that's sort of why we include journal impact factors in this workshop is, is it something to pay attention to? Um, I wouldn't, um, just the fact that a journal is assigned an impact factor means it's a quality, it's a really quality, highly desirable journal. And I'm just gonna do an example. Let's do just journal of 
forest tree, and here it is. And I have to say, journal citation reports, it's not the easiest. They don't have the greatest display as far as what you really want to look at. But if you scan down, this is the page for journal forestry. If you scan down, you can see in 2019, the impact factor for this journal is 2.342. And I think they give you a graph where you can kind of see it's kind of gone up and down a little bit over the years, which is true of most journals. But you go, well, is that good or not so good? What does that mean? And like an H index, it's all relative. So what you want to do is look at other forestry journals and see what their impact factors are. So if you keep scanning on the page, you'll see a tab called rank. And if you click on that rank, you'll see that this journal is, a, is assigned to the subject category forestry. And in 2019, it was number 13 out of 68 forestry journals. So it's in the first quartile. And you can see it actually increased in, in or its journal, impact factor improved because in 2018, <clears throat> it was in the second quartile, it was 19 out of 67 journals. So it's probably to me interesting is to see what other, what those other journals are. So if you scan back up to the top of the page, the category is forestry and some journals may have more than be assigned more than one category. Uh, usually it's one, one or two, maybe three categories, depending on the journal. And here's all the journals that have been ranked for forestry that have impact factors. And you can see the number one journal right now is Current Forestry Reports, and it has an impact factor of 4.972. So that's not that much higher than Journal Forestry, which is down here at 13. And let's go down. Let's say what's the lowest. And the lowest you can see we have 0.336. So if you're looking for, you know, good places to publish in, you may want to come to journal citation reports and look at the subject listing for your area, your category, and just see what journals are in there. Some of them might be appropriate for your research, some may not be. And to give you an example of how um, these journal citation, um, or not journal citation, but the journal impact factors really vary by discipline. So in forestry, the highest was 4.972, but, but let's look at medicine because that's a highly, that's an area where there are a lot of researchers, a lot of, a lot, actually a lot of medical journals. And you can see New England Journal of Medicine, its impact factor is almost 75. So you can see there's a big difference in fields. In, in medicine, it's in the category general internal medicine. Let's go down to rank here. Rank, it's actually, Currently it's number one, and it looks like it's always number one. <laughs> so new, if you're in medicine, New England Journal of Medicine would be a great journal to publish in. But it's, it all depends, you know, there's a lot more people publishing in this area, so a lot more people are citing each other, and so the impact factors are going to be higher. In forestry, there's a smaller number of researchers, so their impact factors, even the top journal, is going to be far less than in the biomedical field. So, as I said, like with H index, everything's relative. And this is, as I mentioned, something usually they do like to see in promotion and tenure packets. They do like to see the um, <clears throat> journal impact factors for your journals. Scopus, which is a competing database with Web of Science, a few years ago came out with something called um, Site Scores, which is their version of the impact factor. 
and it's computed on three years of data <clears throat> versus two. So it's very similar. And so they're both good metrics to use. So any, any questions about journal impact factors? I don't see any. I don't see any, so Rebecca can take over. Take it away. All right, so we've been talking a lot about profiles and metrics and so you know, creating your profile and how do you judge your metrics. But another piece is where do you store your information? Um, could be journal articles, could be conference presentations, posters, papers, abstracts, um, other information. And this could be whether you're a student, whether you're a researcher. So there's different repositories that you can save your information to. And these are actually for the finished product more than when you're working on a piece. So this is not so much for storage as you are cr creating your work or writing your work or doing the research. Um, but once you have the finished paper um, or presentation or data set, and so the University of Missouri has a repository that is open for you to store information in. It's called MoSpace. It's linked on that guide that Jana showed, and it's also linked on that handout. And you're welcome to store information here. So if you present a poster, say, you can send that. There's a link up here at the top where it says submit works. So you can easily submit your work. So it tells you who, you who can do it and it tells you how you can and the preferred file type, but there's additional ones that can be placed in here. And what it will do is it'll give you a permanent storage, a st permanent site to get that information. And I am gonna pull up one photojournalists pandemic and I like this one because it shows the different document types. So even though PDFs preferred. So here's this one by Kat Duncan et al. And so here's what the a record looks like. And it gives it a stable URL and you can use that on your website. You can use it in one of your profiles. You could use it on your CV so that people can get back to this work and see what you've done. Also, this repository, as well as the other ones that are out there, are crawled by Google, so it's discoverable because it's searched. There's also some other search engines, like the base search engine, the, which is the Belfeld Academic Search Engine crawls repositories. So if people are looking for your work, this helps them find it. And you can see that they have quite a few different document types in here. They have JPEGs, PDF, they have WAVE and MP3 files. So you can actually have that information in here or the, the documents in here for people to access. And since we've been talking about metrics, there is a show statistical information link. And yes, it's working today. The other week it was not working. So it shows Basic information on this, so the downloads and item view. So there's been 97 of them, 65 have been the item view. So more views than downloads, which is typical. They also show countries. So you can say, where have the people been coming from? So you can say, this is, has an international impact because it's been viewed from people from throughout the world. So they have, again, by views and by downloads, so you can track that information. And then if you scroll down, since this one had multiple documents in here or multiple records, you can see the downloads by, you know, the PDF, by the JPEG, by the WAV file. So it's actually interesting to see how the work was picked up. So that's one piece to keep in mind is that in create your profile, you know, do your research and your publications and presentations and also ch um, check your profiles, but also make sure your work is getting out there. I mean, obviously, if you're going to publish in a journal or in a book, it's going to be show up on a site or in a doc in a physical 
object somewhere. But you can also use these repositories to get your work out there and have people find it. So I highly recommend that you use MoSpace, especially if you're faculty, if you have graduate students or even undergraduates and they are producing um, research documents and such that you can have them say, and part of what you need to do is have it submitted to MoSpace. So you have start building your portfolio. Um, that said, there are other um, repositories. And so I'm going to show Figshare. Um, and I am thinking I should go to that guide, but it's just quicker to type in here. Figshare is also um, an open repository in the sense that it's not affiliated with an organization. And I'll come back to that in a moment. This one is a freemium, meaning that there's some basic level storage that you can use for free. And then if you want to do more, or if you're an institution, you can pay. Um, our institution's already paying for the most space platform. So we have that. And I'm going to do, I think it's monkeys and math that I like to search on. And if you look, you can log in, if you want to use Figshare, you can log in and you can pull up the information and you can see that they have filters on the left and such. So I'm looking at basic math and monkeys and college students. And so this one you see actually does have the alt metric statistics. So you can check and see how many news outlets, how many times it's been tweeted. Janice mentioned Mendeley. So this one has 260 readers in Mendeley, etc. So if this is useful to you in you tracking your reach and um, demonstrating your importance in the field that's available here. And they should have the, yes, the down below, they have a DOI number for this, and then they have the data sets and the documents attached. Um, so that gives you an idea. That's just two there. As I mentioned, there's many. If you get a National Institutes of Health or NIH grant, you're going to need to submit to PubMed Central. So depending on which agency you go through may determine which repository you use. And so for that, I am going to leave Figshare and go to, I'm actually going to go to Sherpa Juliet. So there's a couple, there's Sherpa Juliet and Sherpa Romeo. So I'm going to start with Juliet since I started with the repositories and was talking about that. So if you have a funder policy, so I don't know if anybody wants to put one in chat of your funder, your dream funder, since I'm down by health. So if you look at National Institutes of Health, it will give you their basic information and they do require open access and they give the different information that you have to follow and where to archive name repository PubMed Central. So if you're going for um, grant research money, you could, they will likely tell you hopefully, but you could also check ahead of time and say, well, what requirements are they gonna have on here? So if I go back to the main page, oops, I went too far back. A brother database to Sherpa Juliet is to track journals to see where, um, if they give open access. So switching um, focus somewhat. So we talked about storing your data in repositories and storing your publications. If you, publish with in a book or a journal, they're going to have you sign for copyright. So that's one thing to look into is like, what rights do you retain? Because it's your work. Um, you should be able to use it in the classroom. Um, can you use it in future research? Can you share it with your library? Can you put it in a repository? What, how tightly constrained is this? So this is something that you should look at ahead of time before signing anything. And if you're working with a group of people, make sure you talk about this before you jump into anything. And you can come into Sherpa Romeo and you can put in a journal title. So I'll do journal 
of forestry. And submit it. And so it gives again the publication information. And then they have um, information here about whether it's open access or not. And if I click on the plus sign to the right, you don't have to try to figure out well, what do their icons mean. They'll s explain them. And so they have an open access fee. So if you want your document to be open accessed, you would have to pay for that. They do work with PubMed Central um, and they have their, so this would be the published version. So the finalized published version after peer review and after all the corrections and everything. Um, if you have the accepted version, what about that one? And it says, well, you can actually put that on your homepage. So where can you store this? So it gives you ideas of how you can share your manuscript, what their requirements are going to be. So if you're thinking of publishing that journal, say you looked it up in the JCR to find its impact factor, and you're like, I want to publish here. It's like, well, what am I going to be able to share? You know, what am I going to be able to hold on to? Or how much am I going to have to negotiate if I want to change that up? And they might, they might negotiate with you. So these are some things to check out and look at. Um, and there's more information if you want to dig in deeper on online race, um, licensing and copyright permissions. Um, and you can drill down on different conditions and different versions of the document, pre-published pre or author accepted. Um, any questions on that? Because that was a real quick look at places to store your information to make it discoverable. And then also finding information about, you know, is it, what rights do you have to your work? Um, and again, something to keep in mind and just something to, to actually um, really pay attention to up ahead. Up, I mean, before you actually get to that, like, oh my God, I got to sign this contract. And I didn't even think about it. Um, and then I'm going to ask, check with Janice, was there anything else? I think we covered it all, right? Um, I'll just say a few more things. Um, studies are, seem to be indicating that publishing open access or when your article becomes open access, it could increase the number of times it's cited. So, um, you know, pay attention to being able to post articles freely when you're given the chance. Um, and as far as, there are a lot of different profiles out there. We just um, covered a few. We certainly recommend getting the ORCID ID and monitoring Scopus to make sure your profile is correct and probably creating a Google profile, a Google Scholar profile, because that sort of gets your name out there. Because once you've created a profile, if somebody searches on your name and you make it public, uh, if you, they search on your name in Google Scholar, it, it'll show up at the top of the search results, um, which people can look at. Um, if you go to our guide that we have, you'll see there are a lot more profiles. Um, one that's kind of been gaining traction lately are the different universities are coming out with their own university profiles. And the University of Missouri has come out with theirs just really in the last year. And that's a way of them being able to sort of highlight the researchers that they have and to encourage collaboration among researchers. And so chances are wherever you go, if you're working for an academic institution, you'll have one of those profiles too. In the case of the University of Missouri, those profiles are created by um, software that's used for tracking your work that is used for um, faculty called my Vita, where you enter your publications and your presentations and your teaching and all that stuff and and so it's just automatically drawn um, from the information you've entered. Um, ResearchGate is um, a lot of people are like ResearchGate. It is a private company but it's a social networking system and 
you may want to try it out, you know, set up a profile and try it out and see if you like um, being in that social networking. I think my impression is you get a lot of email if you're in ResearchGate, but that's a possibility. Um, there's some other ones like humanities. Um, there's a humanities one for humanities researchers. ResearchGate is primarily science and social science people. So basically, you know, go through that list and maybe if you see one that looks good, try it out. And if you like it, stick with it. If you don't, you know, look out your profile when you can. Okay. And one last tip is that if you have an article coming out or a book coming out that you think is very important, like the leaf vibrations, um, insect biomass, uh, topics, you can actually prepare the PR on that ahead of time where you can work with the campus PR departments and say, hey, I have this article that's actually in press. I mean, it's in press. It's not out yet. And they actually prefer that because then they can get the blurbs written up or maybe even a photo of you. And then it can be ready to be sent out on the day it's published. And that could also be something to think of, as Janice says, if some when the embargoes come off you could actually send it out again then just to get your work out there. I mean, part of it's for the data, but part of it is the data showing that you've had an impact and you want your information to reach people so then they can take action on it. So thank you everybody for your, for attending. And if you have questions, feel free to give us a shout. Our contact information is on the handout and also on the library websites. I am going to end the recording, but we will stick around because there were a couple of questions.